All right, everyone, I'm going to get started. Um, hi, my name is Joy Meads, and I'm the director of Dramaturgy and New Works here at American Conservatory Theater. I'm really happy to welcome you all here to um, hear a selection from a new book by one of my favorite writers, David Adjmi. The book is called Lot Six. Um, before we begin, I want to tell you that this event is being presented by American Conservatory Theater and also our bookstore partner, East Bay Booksellers. East Bay Booksellers is my neighborhood bookstore. Um, it's been around for 37, or 27 years in the Bay Area, and I wanted to read you a little bit from the store philosophy, um, which is on their website. Gotta love a bookstore with a manifesto. So it says, East Bay Booksellers was created to provide a place for creating and maintaining community in an atmosphere that promotes the free, mutually supportive exchange of ideas and experiences. As a cultural center within the larger society, we are trying to support an increasingly fa fragile ecology of creative, mutually supportive, compassionate thought with an eye particularly at the frayed edges, the marginalized, the silence, the targets of myriad violence. This is a commitment, not simply to an abstract ideal, but also to the um, kind of actual society in which we want to live. So I want to thank East Bay Booksellers so much for partnering with us. If you're ever in Oakland, it's a great place to visit. And I, if you haven't yet um, purchased uh, David's incredible book, I encourage you to do it through East Bay Booksellers website and the link's right there. Um, I'm overjoyed to be joined by David Ajmi, who, um, is an incredible playwright. Uh, he was once called Virtuosic by the New York Times and was named one of the top 10 in culture by the New Yorker in 2011. His plays have been produced and developed by the Royal Shakespeare Company, Soho Rep, Lincoln Center, Steppenwolf, and many, many others. He was awarded a Mellon Foundation grant, the Guggenheim Fellowship, the Whiting Writers Award, the Kessel Ring Prize for Drama, the Steinberg Playwright Award, McKnight and Jerome Fellowships, and the Bush Artist Fellowship, among others. He's long been one of the most gifted playwrights writing today, and with Lot 6, he's proved himself equally adept at writing long-form memoir. Couldn't be more thrilled to have David with us here today. David, hello, how are you? Hey, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Can you see me? I can see you. Hi, <laughs> Great. Hi everybody. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you to everyone um, at ACT for hosting this reading. Thank you to Joy and everyone involved. Um, so um, I think what I'm going to do is read a tiny bit from my book, and then I guess we can chat a little bit. Um, but I should say that this book is a memoir that um, was took me 10 years to write because I didn't exactly know what I was doing. <laughs> I was asked by a publisher at HarperCollins to write a memoir. And so I had to uh, work my way through it. And what it turned into was a book about the building of an identity and how the building of an identity eventually gets sublimated into um, becoming an artist and making, in my case, writing plays and now writing this book. So um, the section that I'm going to read is just a short section and it's early on in the book, and it's um, about me having my bar mitzvah. <laughs> um, okay. My bar mitzvah was that spring, and the ceremony was at the Ahi Ezer Synagogue on Avenue S. I remember sitting in the pews as a quorum of Jewish men wearing microscopic expressions hovered over me. My father, some, some uncle I barely knew, I looked like a boiled egg. My skin was impossibly white. My eyes beamed terror and discomfort. One of the men rolled up my shirt sleeve to reveal a naked white forearm with its sheath of incongruous tiny hairs. Then he and the others took turns wrapping my arm in a black leather strap connected to a black cube positioned near my shoulder. The cube, I assumed, contained one of those wrapped scrolls with biblical passages inscribed in miniature. And of course I would have to kiss it. I had to kiss everything but the kissing was bereft of any affection. There was something uncaring in the ritual that reminded me of the strange hushed violence of my doctor's exam, the frigid chill of a stethoscope pressed against warm skin. One by one, the men took a turn of the strap, wrapping the leather tighter and tighter as the pain scaled my left arm. I looked to my father for some sign of warmth or recognition, but he barely noticed me. He was a faceless stranger. 
he'd fuse with the cabal of men. Any hint of individuation would break their grim unison. When they were done, the rabbi said something and the men chanted in response. He said something else and then a chorus of women who'd been totally silent up to then, I'd forgotten they were there, thundered with surprising violence, forcing my eyes upward to the mezzanine. I looked for my mother, but she was hidden in the tumble of raked hats. I imagined her up there, somber in her motherliness, watching mutely as I was taken from one column to another, from the world of epicene boys to the world of men, a border invisibly separating us forever. I was led to a dais where I stood, legs shaking, my poor arm battered and violated, and dutifully wailed my haftarah portion in my thin, tiny voice. After the ceremony, as people congratulated my parents and my relatives all caught up and dispensed barbed endearments, I sneaked away to the basement where the DJ was setting up. The party room had a darkly lustrous feel. It was strangely pagan. There were fluted pilasters, a disco ball, Dim, long walls were lined with panels of smoked mirror, each snaked with veins of pale gold. I stood before one in the Italian suit my father bought from some discount outlet on Long Island. My reflection intersected with beams from overhead light, monobrow and pimples on full display, the gap in my teeth, a chasm that split my face in half. I hated the boy-man chimera I'd become. I felt humiliated by the ceremony, which wasn't really for me, it wasn't even for my parents. It was for some judiciary force that claimed our lives, a force I couldn't see, only feel. I didn't think it was God, it was something else. It was dark and ruthless and unforgiving. When the party was in full swing, I hid at a table anchoring bouquets of red and silver mylar balloons that matched the color schemes of the invitations. Richie and Stevie, those are my brothers, were smoking cigars with Mara Shalom. Debbie was vaunting about her calligraphy for the invitations. Arlene, that's my sister, smoked camel lights and fended off compliments about the red dress she bought for $10 at Joyce Leslie because she had no money. She was very vocal about hating her dress. She said she felt low class. She didn't even want to come to the party. She had no money and no plan for her life. You look stunning in that dress, said Debbie, who was bouncing her daughter to the beat of Vamos a la Playa. This dress is a piece of shit, said Arlene. The DJ from 92 WKTU was in full swing now. The dance floor was getting crowded. Ooh, it's my song, cried Debbie, when he played Somebody's Watching Me. Stevie, dance with me. Stevie wore a brown suit and he'd grown a thin mustache. His shirt was unbuttoned to the solar plexus. His neck cross-hatched with gold chains. Dance with yourself, he said, puffing on a cigar. She turned to me. Dave, you want to dance? I vowed to never dance publicly, though I knew how by watching Arlene practice, practice disco at home. The idea of people watching and judging me, even if the judgment was positive and encouraging, filled me with dread. Debbie's body began to jerk and spasm and convulse with dance. Let's boogie, Dave. She handed the baby to Stevie. Ugh, no, I don't want to, I said, but it didn't matter what I wanted or didn't want. Debbie dragged me onto the dance floor. Everyone started clapping. The DJ made some comment over the speaker. My mother was saying, hillu, hillu. They could see my pimples. They could see the single undisrupted horizon of my eyebrows, like someone drew a thick line across my forehead and black marker. There was no way for me to shield myself from the draconian judgment. I searched for some nuanced way of complying without making a spectacle of myself. I swayed neutrally. I made tiny unnatural movements with my arms and legs. Debbie was shockingly uninhibited. She was windmilling her arms, whipping her head around at unpredictable angles to Hey Mickey, and shaking her fists like they were pom-poms. Even post-pregnancy, she had enormous reserves of energy. She was dancing slightly faster than the beat of the song, as if the song would catch up to her. Quantities of jewelry swung from her neck and banged in loud zirconium claps. Debbie's bravery made me slightly braver. I started to loosen up. The dance floor was getting fuller. Arlene was doing salsa moves in her $10 Joyce Leslie dress. She was dancing with Howie, who was spinning and swinging his arms and wiping pips of sweat from his forehead. My mother and father were dancing together. Ari Bloom was dancing with my cousin Grace, who wore a lavender off the sleeve taffeta dress. The boys from my yeshiva were practicing their spins and pop and locks and various arthropodal breakdancing poses. 
Nechama Poland was dancing with Danielle Sibner, who wore a long prairie skirt and was jumping in rigid vertical bounces and repositioning her clunky glasses every few seconds. I didn't think people would show up, but everyone came. It didn't matter that no one was really close or got along with one another or liked their outfits or had enough money. There was something democratizing about the dance floor. Somehow, we became the purest, truest versions of ourselves. When Billie Jean came on, the feeling changed in the room. It was a song everyone wanted to dance to. Though I couldn't understand the narrative of Billie Jean, I felt the force of its urgency. There was something in the music that gripped the room like a fist. The song felt serious in a way that mocked the liturgy of the ceremony we just come from. The pressures encircling me lifted. I lost the feeling of being watched and became one with the music. I felt light as air. My skin melted away like dead weight. The dance floor was crowded with strange silhouettes, soaked bodies. Partners slid from one to another. Whirls of reflected light showered the room like spinning bits of glitter. My hair was standing on end. My heart beat so hard, I thought my chest would explode. I was out of shape. I thought I might collapse, but I pushed my body to its limits. I became one with Michael Jackson. I became one with the gold chains, the slithering bodies and damp swaths of Armani. We were a single corpus, a single undulant body. We were Bacchants, worshiping at the altar of disco. As I got more and more lost in the music, I felt myself reaching for something, not physically, but inside myself. I was reaching for something I couldn't name. A deep yearning broke inside me like a dam. That's it. Yay. Hey, that was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. Well, so we wanted to have a little conversation and I encourage everyone in the audience to use the Q and A button at the bottom towards the right um, and just ask any questions you got in that panel. Um, but I'm going to start out with someone. So something. Um, so as I understand it, you were approached to write this book um, by Harper Collins and agreed to do it. Um, and I think writing a book of, you know, um, is a daunting task to begin with. And uh, it's only exacerbated when it's a book about yourself and your own life. Uh, and I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit about the process of crafting the narrative of your life. Was it clear from the beginning what the thrust of the story would be? Or um, is that something you discovered through the process? And is there anything you grew to better understand or appreciate about your history through the process of writing this book? Um, okay, well, there's a lot there to unpack. So I didn't know what my narrative was going to be at all. I had no real impetus to write a book. Um, Harper Collins saw a play that I'd done at Lincoln Center. It was kind of my New York debut. It was called Stunning. And I'm from this community, and this book really details it. It's a community of Syrian Sephardic Jews. Um, from this area of, of Brooklyn called Midwood. Very insular community of Jews that were sort of back in the day kicked out of Spain by Queen Isabella. Thanks, Queen Isabella. They actually just asked us to come back. Now we can, I can get my <laughs> Spanish passport. But, but back in, you know, then they said, get out. We went to like diff different Middle Eastern countries, Ottoman Empire, and then Brooklyn. So um, this community has its own shibboleth, its own way of speaking, its own slang. It's... Um, its own kind of foods. It's really sort of slight, somewhat invisible. And so I was never totally comfortable knowing what to, um, how to represent it. Because it's not even like I'm marginalized in a way that's salient. <laughs> like, <laughs> like the marginalized, not like, oh, I'm marginalized and I could get my like placards and like go to yeah. Hyde Park Corner and complain. Because I didn't really know like what to complain about. And I'm gay on top of it. So it's sort of like, so I wrote this play stunning about this community thinking, no one's going to do this play. I mean, this is not going to be on anyone's radar because who's going to want to see a play about people no one have, have ever heard of? And then it turns out that Lincoln Center thought it would be a good idea. And then the play actually kind of did really well. So it was a very strange thing. And then HarperCollins asked me to write the book based on that play and an article in the paper that they read about me. And I just sort of took the deal under the auspices that I would like you know, write an intellectual essay or something, like a series of intellectual essays. Cause I thought like, oh, I want people to see this other side of me. Oh, I'm, <laughs> you know, I'll be this book person. And I had this whole idea of like how smarty pants I was going to be with this book about all these fancy things that I knew and learned and this and that. And then, and so we agreed, okay, great. You write 10 essays. 
it'll be loosely around the theme of self-invention, but it'll be like these intellectual essays and it'll have a memoir component, but that'll be sort of the, not as dominant. And, and as I kept going, I realized that it was a little bit BS and that I, <laughs> I had a craving to actually mine stuff. I mean, I didn't, I didn't enjoy mining it. I didn't really want to like the way you want to go out and get, you know, an ice cream sundae. <laughs> but I felt a need to do it. And I felt there was something there that there were, there were dots that needed to be connected inside of me. Like my life wasn't totally coherent and I could feel myself wanting it to become coherent. Yeah. And so it was a combination of both exhuming things that I hadn't really looked at and interrogated, but also sort of crafting things um, <laughs> into writing. Uh, it was a sort of double process. Um, and that sort of became what the, I don't know if I'm making sense, but that yeah. sort of, that sort of taught me what the book wanted to be in terms of its structure and its content. And it really became a book about how we make stories from our lives. I mean, it sounds so yeah. cliche when I even say it, but I realized that I didn't, I think because I felt so marginal mm -hmm. and, in, and then my community felt so marginal. I felt so marginal in the community. And there were so many like nesting shells of exile. I didn't really even think to form a um, history for myself. You know, I sort of wanted to insert myself into the history of something that was a yeah. dominant culture so that I would feel like it was coherent to other people and I wouldn't have to like argue for my little like island of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> marginalia. And so, so anyways, so the book really does become about narrative in a lot of ways. And it becomes about how we can, we can use fictions and narratives as technologies to um, distill and like craft understandings of our own lives. Did I answer all your questions? Absolutely, I I answered, like, you did. I answered, you answered like, them with, beautifully. No, no I answered like a fraction of one of the questions, but it's okay. No, it's good. Um, well, one of the things I really love about your book is um, how the, it flies in the face of, I think, uh, a dirty lie that we're told in America, which is, um, I think that there's this this trope in America of the kind of journey of self-discovery that begins with somebody like going out in the woods by themselves, right? As though um, the way to really discover who you are in, in essence is um, in uh, total solitude and out of relation with other people. And what I, one of the things that I love about your book is that um, I think it's much more honest about uh, about the nature of identity that actually much of identity formation is contextual and and relational um, and it, and like how we are with our you know mom or with your friends that's part of who you are right and there's not really a way to understand yourself um, without understanding those social dynamics so I guess what I'm curious is if you can talk a little bit about, like, there's a kind of iterative process of self-discovery in this book where you kind of venture out and, and meet different groups of people and find different facets of possibility within yourself. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm curious about how uh, that, that kind of iterative process of discovery and if there's anything that you uncovered that really felt like it was you know, less plastic, that it was something that you brought with you in right. every, yeah. So, so, so it really, I mean, the book has different sections and the first section is me as a little kid. I mean, it is Dickensian almost because I start, it yeah. starts when I'm like seven or eight and, um, and it starts with me trying, you know, my family wasn't a great compass for me to understand the world. My family was like kind of messed up and I was much younger than my siblings. Everyone was sort of off on their own and I was really kind of trying to get some kind of map for what life could be and what my possibility, like we all are, right? Like what, mm -hmm. who could I be in this world and what can I do? And the, the, the possibilities in this community are very circumscribed. It's very businessy and very right wing. And I was like this sort of nascently closeted gay kid going, no, like I wanna, like, and, I, and my mother would take me to, to the theater and take me to museums and take me to the movies and take me to this and that. And with all of these like experiences, each experience was so profound for me, mm -hmm. like in terms of going, 
what's that? Like, what is this little interface? Like what's happening to me when I see this art and when I, or when I see, or when I go to this new environment and how are my assumptions about reality being formed or challenged? Cause I didn't understand what was real. It just, I grew up in a very depressed environment and I was like, is this it? Like, it can't be it. And so, but you know, I, so I sort of was using, so like to your point mm -hmm. from a very young age, I was feeling myself like almost this webbing occur or this like threading between popular culture, highbrow culture, whatever, metropolitan places and, and, and me and my inner self. Because my inner self, the, the way that I was being formed by, by my family and community felt very alien to me. It did not feel native. But there were bits and pieces in art, like for example, like I talk about seeing Sweeney Todd and like <laughs> Sweeney Todd really isn't a play for a little boy. Like my mother <laughs> should not have taken me that, but I didn't want to leave. I was obsessed. And at the intermission, she was like, you're going. And I was like, no, no, I have to stay and watch this play because there was something that resonated so deeply in that work of art. So it wasn't even just, um, it wasn't, just, it's not even so much, you know, it's, it, the book is about, yes, me taking an art. And then it's also in the second part, it's me taking an art and also me almost chameleon, like a chameleon figure, yeah. like Zelig going, okay, could I be like that person? Mm -hmm. Could That person seems like they have a great life and they wore that outfit. If I wear that outfit, could I have a great life? Yeah. Does that person even have a great life? If I wore that outfit, could I actually transform, could it, the outfit like osmos into me and change my molecules so that I would become the, per, the kind of person who would look good in that outfit? I mean, it was literally like these series of experiments because I had so little understanding of the world and how to become a person that would comfortably inhabit a world I wanted to live in mm -hmm. um, that felt good to me that I was just so naive about it. So the book almost, there's, <laughs> the big chunk of the book is just me ex doing these little experiments, very, very regimented experiments about where, in which I imitate these people or imitate fashion you know, spreads and buy the clothes or imitate characters in films mm -hmm. and try to see if I, could, if I could learn something about myself or transform myself yeah. by having these experiences and trying to change my outward. It's like, an, it's like they call it outside in, in acting, right? The uh -huh. outside in approach. So I wasn't doing Stanislavski. <laughs> I wasn't channeling, I wasn't channeling the deepest part of me. I was trying to do this outside in like, oh, if I just like stay in this environment and these outfits, maybe I'll be this like really cool, respectable person and, and, and I'll, and my whole life will change. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. We have a bunch of questions from the audience at this point. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to ask them, even though I have a bunch of, you know, things that, uh, I'm curious about too. So here we go. Uh, Larry Rand asked, um, David, was your ability to overcome dancing, your fear of dancing in public empowering? What was the feeling you described that you couldn't quite reach or name? Ironically, dancing well is such a key attribute of successful and <laughs> hip. S wise? Is that how you say it out loud? How do you say yeah, it out that's loud? Yeah, that's S wise. Yeah, right. that's the Syri that's what the Syrian Jews call themselves. Yeah. Um, how did I what okay, so that was a really good question. How did I overcome my fear of dancing? You know what? Honestly, I've always been shy about dancing, but I think I am a good dancer. I was saying this to you earlier. Yeah. I am a good dancer, but I'm shy about dancing because dancing is this very sort of like primal expression of the self, right? And it's also like slightly sexual expression of the self. You know, you can get kind of erotic when you dance. So, and I kind of knew that when I was 13, I was like, ooh, I don't want that. You know, I don't want to put that on display. I'm still shy, but like, I'm always shy. It's, but this is how I am with every social interaction. I'm uh -huh. shy and then I can get into it. Eventually, like if I sort of just break through the barrier, I'm naturally an extremely introverted person. Mm -hmm. And my tendency is to want to go hide. But if I push myself, I actually can be um, social and expressive. So there was, so that answers that. And then the second part is what is the feeling? Um, I think that there was, there's another thing in this book that I realized about myself when I was writing the book, which really surprised me because I see myself as an antisocial person. But this sort of, this sort of links to what you were saying initially that selfhood is actually composite, right? Mm -hmm. That selfhood is that we are a species first and that all these, like language is communal. 
Like I sit in my room and write my little words, yeah. but I'm using a language that doesn't really belong to me, that speaks through me in some yeah. ways. And so I realized like that these moments of shared experience, um, whether I'm com communing with like a yeah. song or a piece of art, when I'm sitting in a darkened oh. theater, um, sharing in a very intense experience with another uh, group of people or with yeah. an artist who's communicating to me through, through the words of a play or whatever it is, that's when I come most alive. Those are the, like these seminal moments in the book where I really come alive and um, where I feel inspired and I feel yeah. connected to the deepest part of myself. Yeah. And I mean, and it happened to me probably when I was dancing, but it, it happens to me through music and art. And uh -huh. that's where I link to this, the most profound part of myself, the most emotional and spiritually like deep part of myself. Uh -huh. And so I feel like that was the thing that maybe broke open inside me. It is like art becomes a place for a kind of collective meaning making, a a, a, a a connection through through something outside of us. I do feel like that that when you go to experience a piece of art, and if it's a really good piece of art, you know they say that your heartbeats yeah. actually start to sync up. Yeah. Um, I had a question about that sense of the question of belonging. Actually, that might kind of link to this. Um, so you know, you start out in the book talking about this very insular community that you were born into, um, and were, you know, had a kind of um, pro forma be belonging to, but um, a belonging that never really felt um, authentically lived. It didn't feel like a place where you could safely express all of who you were, right? Um, and so it seems like you, you felt very comfortable with being an outsider that began to feel very natural, the outsider, the observer, right? And I guess I had a question if that's something that you've carried with you, um, if that's kind of sense of comfort of the role of being on the outside, observing and looking in, and if you felt um, the pull of belonging or identification, you know, as you've gotten later in your career, you're in a moment where you, your voice and your art is celebrated. Does that, do you feel like a sense of in-group <laughs> membership? through that success or, or, or do you, do you kind of revert to the, um, the, the knowledge in your muscles of, of, of feeling like you're looking from the inside, outside in? I think, I think playwrights are particularly schizoid because we are outsiders and observers. And then we also like really want to hang out. <laughs> I didn't understand this about myself. I told myself that I was only an outsider and an observer, but I noticed that as I kept going with my playwriting career, I started to really enjoy hanging out with the actors. Yeah. So I didn't, it's weird. I don't see myself as a social person. I do think fundamentally though, my orientation to the world, I don't see myself as a part of any in-group. Mm -hmm. I don't really like in-groups. Yeah. Um, I avoid them. I just can't, I can't, um, I, I don't know how to process my life through that lens. Yeah. It's just not for me. I'm naturally, I'm not saying I'm comfortable mm -hmm. or I fetishize my observerships. I, but I just, and I didn't, as I was, when I was a kid, I didn't like it. Yeah. It's, and it's not even that it's familiar. It's just this lens that I can, it's like E.T., right? Like yeah. when E.T. was walking, when E.T. was in Elliot's house, he just sort of like, you know, operated like, okay, I really don't belong in this house, but I'm going to drink beer and try to hang out in this environment. This is where I am right now. That is, I think, <laughs> my orientation. I really related in that movie to E.T. I was like, I totally get. He's just kind of like, they put him in the closet and they stick a wig on his head. Okay, fine. I'm in the closet with a wig <laughs> on my head. <laughs> That's great. Hey, we have a question from Alan Klein who says, how does writing a play differ from writing a book? Well, writing a book is so much harder. I don't know. For me, for me personally, mm -hmm. just the volume of words makes it really, really hard. And it really makes it hard to find the shape. I think yeah. with a play, like I'm very good at understanding, you know, how each part relates to the whole in a play and how I can create a sense of build. And I think because books are so 
giant, or at least this one felt really large to me. It was very hard to figure out how to weave the themes and um, create sort of tensions and mm -hmm. frames around different um, sort of ideas or themes or whatever it is, so that you can sort of build this kind of tapestry or pattern, because I think that's what narrative art is in a certain way. It's yeah. a kind of series of patterns. And mm -hmm. I had a hard time, but this was like arabesques. <laughs> like it was like <laughs> huge, like a like gigantic um, sprawling patterns. And I found it really, really hard. And writing a memoir is hell because you don't get to camouflage yourself the way I really wanna do. Yeah. Um, with the way all artists wanna do. I'm always writing from a personal place. That's just my orientation. Um, and I'm not going to say that my, my plays are just these stories I come up with and blah, blah, blah. No, they're all me. Yeah. Every single character is probably me. I invest very deeply. I get very emotionally wrapped up in every single play that I write when I'm writing it. And, um, they're all spiritually autobiographical, but that's different from this. Yeah. But in, and, and in this, it was the opposite because I actually had to take the empirical events of my life and start shaping and sculpting and constructing and compressing to make it like, like feel like a book, like to give it this artificial construction so that you have a sense of like beginning, middle and end and lives don't have that. So it was in a way it was almost inverted. Like the process was inverted. Yeah. I wonder, I think this is universal that we all have a very strong desire to be fully known and also a fear of being known and seen. <laughs> and I guess I wonder how that kind of push-pull um, played out for you in the writing process of writing this book about yourself. Did you have to gain a sense of comfort over time with the kind of, because you're not, I think you have an allergy to bullshit. You've, you've delved for truth in your work and, and your work is always spiritually and I think exposed, emotionally exposed. I think and, yeah. for, for, for me, it was sort of like I had to find a persona and a narrative voice for myself as a character because I couldn't, it, otherwise it was just turning into diary entries, you know, yeah. or like a telephone conversation. I, and I wasn't into that. It didn't yeah. feel like literary to me. So I had to find a literary conceit so that I could then speak through this voice yeah. and use the voice so that, that there's a tension between the voice and then this like raw protoplasm, that's me, yeah. right? So, so I could, cause you can't just like blurt it all out, right? Like <laughs> no one wants to read that and no one wants to hear it. Yeah. So once I understood what the voice of the character was, I could write me slash him mm. um, in a way that was very neutral, like objective. I, I, I yeah. compare, keep comparing it to like drawing a still life. Mm -hmm. So I could see my, I can see myself kind of clearly actually in a weird way. Mm -hmm. So I would just draw myself and um, whatever I did, I just draw it. And if I was embarrassed about something or I felt ashamed, I would draw that. And then if I felt very happy, I draw that. And so I didn't, and I did that with every single character in the book. Mm. I didn't, I didn't put it, I tried to do it as neutrally and filterlessly as possible. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously there's the filter of the narrative voice, yeah. but, um, and, it, and he sees things a certain way. I mean, he slash me uh -huh. sees things a certain way. Um, but like, did I want to necessarily share my true self with everybody? No, mm -hmm. but did I want to do that? Yes. Like, yeah, I, I, it's what you said. There is, it's, I feel this like real need to, to share my testimony with mm -hmm. the world. Um, because I feel like I'm capable of doing it in a very truthful way about what it meant for me to craft myself into a human being and in a very very subatomic like very very molecular way what were the phases what were the delusions what was the heuristic of it and um what did i learn about myself um, in that process and from making these mistakes and um i thought it was valuable so in the end that trumps my ego you know what i mean like because yeah. my ego it's all about my ego my ego felt scared and ashamed and like didn't want to do it, but my artist self wanted to do it. 
That's great. Hey, we have a question from Sarah here um, who says, uh, it's a wonderful book. She says she could see herself and her kids in it. She loved the self-awareness and realized that she had similar experiences, but not the same level of self-awareness, even at her much older age. I wonder how much of it is your understanding now looking back versus how much you were able to perceive at the time? I think that it's weird. Uh, that's a really great question. Yeah. I, I kind of knew what I was doing, but I had to lie to myself um, during these different phases of my evolution and these different roles that I was sort of assuming. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't necessarily positing to myself exactly what I was doing with all the philosophical assumptions behind it. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I was just going on instinct. So I think what I did in the book was like, in order to make it coherent for the reader, I had to sort of map it out as something that was more in steps. You know what I mean? Like a little bit more linear and a little bit clearer than it was in life. Because in life, I was trying things out and it was a combination of strategy, politics, instinct, and just like adolescent flailing around. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Like. It was a it was a weird soup of all those things, yeah. and so yeah, it was hard to really it was really hard to describe my awareness of myself yeah. because it was because it fluctuated so much too. It's sort of like yeah. I scissored in and out of these different states of lucidity, and then I would just sort of go on instinct and 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 not be aware of things. So. Yeah, and sublimate things and yeah. going back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, this is a question from an anonymous attendee uh, who saw your play, Marie Antoinette, wonderful play at Steppenwolf. Um, and they're curious to know how that was spiritually autobiographical. Does that feel too personal to share or like, is that a thing? Uh, how is that play spiritual? I think that that play, I mean, it's, it's, it's autobiographical in many ways. Mm -hmm. I would say that Marie, the way I imagined her, yeah. um, is somebody who felt very disconnected from her family. I mean, I'm just <laughs> saying this for the first time. I'm just <laughs> looking at it now, but it's not, I was not conscious in the writing and I wrote that play in two days, right? So yeah. she's someone who was very disconnected from her family, who didn't feel she was raised, that she had to build herself. She says at one point, I, was, yeah. I wasn't raised, I was built, which is actually a line from Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> I, <gave her. laughs> I know but anyways um she 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 and she um and she doesn't understand she sort of feels that she is um moving through these different roles and identities and putting on different outfits trying to i mean it is the book it's exactly yeah. the book she's trying on her outfits <laughs> and trying on different fashions to feel that she could um f f garner some self-worth as a person i mean it's so like duh like it's exactly <laughs> on the nose. <laughs> yeah, only if like she was able to create a whole set for herself, like a, yeah. maybe I'll be a peasant of yeah. this farmhouse. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, amazing. Okay, great. And then there was a uh, connected question, which is how has your creativity been impacted by the pandemic? Well, in the beginning, I was incredibly creative. And when everyone was freaking out, and they couldn't do anything or write. I was like writing like a maniac all day and reading War and Peace as part of that Tolstoy together thing. I was really, I think that was my survival mechanism for about two months. I was just like, blah, 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 blah. and then, and then I freaked out. I, I, I definitely freaked out. And, and for now, right now I'm not being creative because I'm just basically trying to promote the book and do interviews and this and that. So in a way it's a relief to turn off that part of myself so I can just sort of like replenish the well. Because I, I, um, I think I was creating from a very manic place because I was trying so hard to push away <laughs> my panic over the pandemic. Yeah. But, um, but um, so we'll see what happens. I think it's. I think we have to find. It's a day to day thing. Yeah. We have to find every day. We have to find a strategy of getting through that particular day. And some days are really, really hard, and we just have to sort of like take it really easy because yeah. this is this is just so difficult. This is really challenging. Um, great, it is difficult. Um, so we have a question from John Price who says, 
How do you think that writing the book will influence your future writing of plays? I actually think they're so separate. I don't think there's yeah. any relationship, to be honest. I mean, I'm writing other plays now and I'm, I'm, I have other things that I'm doing, but I like things to be really different. Mm -hmm. Like I'm actually writing another book and the book is really different from, from this memoir, it's fiction. But I like the idea of just like shaking it up. So I don't think they'll, people have been asking me that, yeah. but I don't, I don't, they might, you know, there might be some interpenetration that I can't know. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, but I don't, I don't see it. They feel so different. They yeah, and different. speaking of plays, there's a play that you wrote that I just want to tell people to look out for, which is called Stereophonic, which was to premiere this fall, but, um, you know, then everything went on pause went away. <laughs> as we decided probably better not to kill artists and audiences <laughs> by <laughs> continuing to meet. So, but just everyone keep an eye out for this play, Stereophonic, which is truly beautiful, um, if you can. Um, and then, whoo, okay, great. So we have two more questions, uh, three more questions. So, uh, this is a question from Larry, who says he really appreciates understanding your total lack of identity growing up, knowing that you didn't fit the identity you're supposed to or expected to, but also that you have no knowledge of what your real identity is either. How does one know how to put one foot in front of the other when you're not sure what path you should be walking down? That's the whole book. Yeah. I mean, that is that is literally the, the big question of the book. Yeah. I think the answer is like I just kept falling falling on my face. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I think I would like, I was attracted to both things that resonated with who I really kind of, this unformed thing in me, but also things that looked great, but had nothing to do with me. Do you know yeah. what I mean? And it was literally like I was trying it all and it was almost kind of like magnets, like some of them, just some of the magnets just stayed. Mm -hmm. And I sort of, they were like, or like little eggs in the Easter basket. Oh, I got an egg. And then you just like realize at some point, Ooh, I feel I'm not self-conscious anymore. I'm not wooden. I'm not performing constantly. I'm not like memorizing words from my, you know, vocabulary builder book and trying to use them in conversations. They just come out. Yeah. I'm not, you know, I can think with a certain kind of critical acuity. I can move through the world and not be so hampered by by my self-consciousness and my feelings of that I'm, I'm, in, I'm an imposter. I don't feel like I'm an imposter. I feel like something has been illuminated inside of me. And that happened probably in my late 20s. I mean, it took a long time, <laughs> my early 30s even. It took a while. I still go back. I still regress sometimes. <laughs> um. So I have a question about the process of writing this book. Um, so, you know, it's, you describe, as we've been talking about a lot, this kind of process of roving discovery to find different versions of yourself, different possibilities of who you could be to escape this confining box that you were born into. And I guess, um, what was it like having to revisit that past that you fled in order to find a more actualized version of yourself um, to uncover memories that maybe you've not spent much time with um, uh, over the last so years. Funny. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's so funny. I've been emailing with Isaac Mizrahi, who's another uh, Syrian Sephardic Jew uh -huh. from this community. And he found my book somehow. And we've been talking a little bit about this in terms of like, you know, going back to the past and because he also wrote a memoir. Uh -huh. And so um, it, it, I feel like I don't feel threatened by going back to the past because I yeah. don't feel, I, it's not activated in me in the mm -hmm. way that it was when I was a kid. Like, I don't feel threatened by it. I don't feel scared. I feel like, no, I feel solid in, in my identity so I can mm -hmm. do it. Yeah, But it's funny, there were moments writing this book, like in any, I mean, it, it's not yeah. therapy, it's not therapy, but, but it is in the sense that you have, to, it mimics therapy, in the sense that you have to revisit, you have to make everything very plangent, and detailed and alive for yourself, so you can write it down. So yeah. you're reliving it, and the more you're reliving it, the more you're back there. Yeah. And sometimes it was really the feeling of powerlessness mm -hmm. I had. Um, 
flipped me out. And there was a period about five years into the writing, because it took me like nine-ish years to do this book. Halfway through, I started losing it, because I just kind of couldn't see the forest for the trees. And I, I didn't know what was in the past or what was in the present anymore, because I was living so much in the past um, in my head. And my friends would often pull me back and be like, I think this is the book. I don't think this is, like if I yeah. said, started talking like a crazy person, they would say, no, 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 this is the book. You're okay. You're not 11 anymore. And yeah. so that was helpful to have people pulling me back. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, great. I, this has gone by really, really quickly. <laughs> um, I have, uh, uh, yeah, I have one more um, one more question for you before we go. I just wonder about, you know, I mean, as a as a friend and admirer, like the beginning of the book, I felt was I I just felt like I wanted to find little little Davy Adme and <laughs> give him like a hug because there's so much loneliness in the in the early part of the book. Um, but I wonder if that sense of alienation or displacement, I, I wonder if it is in some way necessary um, for the work of an artist. I wonder, do you think it is possible to be a great writer if you haven't felt that sense of um, being an outsider, that sense of not belonging in some way? I don't know. You know, I got dragged on Twitter. Someone, because I, so, some, a, an interviewer in the New York Review of Books asked me, like, do you think the loneliness you experienced contributed to your sensibility as a writer? And I said, yes, which is true. I don't necessarily, I'm not making a statement about mm -hmm. if pain, you need to be in pain and suffering like Vincent van Gogh to, mm. you know, become a writer or I mean, to become a painter or a writer or whatever. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't really know what the font is. I do know that to make work, you have to in some way separate yourself yeah. from the comforts of a diurnal existence mm -hmm. so that you can ha so that you can observe it in such a way so that you have a vantage that is very particular. Yeah. That is sort of the nature of being an artist. You're sort of showing the world the way something looks to you and you have to cultivate that, that um, vantage in a yeah. certain way. And I don't know how to do it if you're just like hanging out and going to parties. I mean, maybe that I, I I, I, I don't doubt that there are so many great artists who, I mean, not Virginia Woolf, but like there are great artists who maybe could do that. I don't know. Yeah. I personally, my, my art comes from um, the, the feeling of being lonely and the feeling of, not even lonely, it's just the feeling of being outside of things. And yeah. the art is the way for me to get in. That right. is my, that's, almost like a, it's like a part of my personality it's another it's a it's a satellite version of me mm -hmm. the plays the book they're ver i live through them i don't have to try on personae in my life i can just do it in my plays and in my books. Yeah. so that relieves me then i can be everything yeah and i kind of need to be everything yeah and i also need to be kind of totally alone <laughs> I need both. Yeah. I mean, it just feels like that that ability to step outside of yourself and observe feels key. Suffering, suffering so. you know, right? Yeah. No. I don't know, like, what the suffering is more of the byproduct of yeah. the, the thing that the artist needs. The suffering yeah. is not the thing that the it's artist not the needs. Thing. No, I don't yeah. think so. And I don't, I don't advocate for art, like make yourself suffer. Like yeah. I never had to, I never said like, oh, let me cut myself. I never did that. <laughs> I never drank. I don't. I don't try to enforce more suffering on myself. Yeah. Um, I don't believe in that at all. But I do think that, I don't know, artists can generally be sensitive people and the world is a very complicated place and artists are sensitive to those complications and those involutions. And it can, it doesn't always feel so comfortable. Yeah. And that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> That's great. I think that's a great place to leave it. Um, so y'all, uh, just really, I can't encourage you enough to uh, buy this book, to read this book. I basically inhaled it. And then um, about a week before we went into quarantine, and then I, I, I've revisited it during this quarantine time, I actually think it's pretty wonderful. It's just a 
incredible book and um, and it is so smart and it also goes by so quickly uh, and it's just a remarkable feat. So I want to thank you so much for writing this incredible book. Thank you for being with us and um, sharing some of it with all of us and Thank you, audience, for coming and listening. I think Thanks, that's everybody. All. Thank you so all much, right. Joy. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Have a good Bye. night, everyone. Bye. See ya.